kind of go through the derivation one time, I won't expect you, I mean, this is actually beyond the scope of this class, really, but I'll show you one time uh, how you can make mechanistic arguments to show what alpha is, but I'll never ask you to do this beyond today. So, uh, if we draw our little picture again, We're going to assume that our little infinitesimal cube is under hydrostatic pressure, P. So it's the same on all sides. It's a stress. It's a stress, so technically it's a fully populated tensor, but since all the values are the same, you know, if you wrote the tensor, it would just be P, P, P. Likewise, our, our pores have fluid in them, and those, that fluid is also at a pressure P. So if, if you'd imagine this scenario and we wanted to then examine what a little piece of the solid matrix material, like so if we were to examine this little piece of material, again, pulling it out, drawing a free body diagram on it, assuming everything's in equilibrium, what would the stress on this guy be? Well, if it's under, if it's under, uh, if it's if everything's under equilibrium, then it'll also have to be P, right? Because there's an, we're talking about a little piece of the solid matrix, let's say in between the pores and the external stress. The pores are under, are applying P to the solid from the inside. The external stress is P, right? So the only thing it could be is P. So also the, this little. Our little piece of solid material also has stress P. And so, you know, um, well, if we wrote down, and this is where I'm going to use some tensor notation because it just gets me through it faster. And, and this is kind of the part that's outside the scope of the class, but so I can, I can, uh, Take any stress and I can decompose it into what we'll call the deviatoric part of the stress plus the hydrostatic part of the stress. And here I've used my Einstein notation again to say that, you know, sigma kk is the sum. It's, it's sigma 1, 1 plus sigma 2, 2 plus sigma 3, 3 because it's a repeated indice. So that's just like writing the sum of k as it goes from 1 to 3. Uh, that last thing is something called a Kronecker delta function. So delta ij takes on the value uh, 1 if i equals to j and 0 if i is not equal to j. Right. So it's sort of like an identity matrix. Um, so then, uh, By definition, and we're going to use a tension positive definition, which is contrary to what we typically use in geomechanics, but for just for the purposes of this derivation, then by definition, we, we're going to call the pressure is equal to the hydrostatic stress, so one-third sigma kk, and therefore our stress tensor, sigma ij, there's no deviatoric stress in this case. It's, it's simply one. It's simply pressure, and since you know we can recognize that that guy, or at least um, that piece, we just defined as pressure. Uh, then sigma ij is a negative of pressure, and sigma ij is minus p. 
failed to ID. So that was sort of a long-winded way to just say our stress tensor for that little piece of solid material we can write as just minus P sub delta IJ. Okay? Now we have, a, I just showed you guys a constitutive model for stress for elasticity, right? So sigma IJ is equal to lambda epsilon KK delta IJ plus 2 mu IJ. Or another way was K. And since we're talking about, actually, since we're talking about the solid material only, so again, we're trying to write down something related to this piece right here, which is only the solid material. It's not including the, whole, the, the, the pores. So because of that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to subscript all of these with S, just to say it's the solid material only, right? Not, not the solid plus the pores. Because, I mean, I hope you understand the distinction, right? If I go in the lab and I test a piece of rock, it's got pores in it. I can't take those pores out. Right? So when I go and I do an unconfined compressive test on it, I can't eliminate those pores, so what I'm testing is the property of really of the skeleton, right? The solid plus the pores. However, you know, my, my uh, rock is probably made out of quartz or something, right? But I, it, so then if I could take a piece of quartz and go to a really small scale, right, and test that piece of quartz, then I'm going to get a different property than if I were to get you know, test the whole set skeleton. So in my example here, you know, I'm, ta I'm talking about the property of the actual solid material, not the property of the, s of the skeleton. So anyway, uh, I, I can rewrite this in terms of different parameters, just like I'd showed on the previous slide. This thing is that is the deviatoric strain, it's the, the part that has to do with shear. And in this case, with only normal stresses applied to it, it's zero. And so then if I plug in on the left-hand side, my I have minus P delta IJ is equal to KS sigma KK delta IJ. And now, Technically, these, I'm using tensor notation, but technically these are like matrices, right? So it's like an identity matrix. And I can't, strictly speaking, I can't just um, divide by a matrix. Right? I can multiply by an inverse, but I can't divide by a matrix. Right? Uh, so in this case, what I can do, I can multiply on both sides by sigma ij. that, and sigma ij times sigma ij, if you go through the rules up there and understand that these are in summations, then this whole thing becomes 3. It's the same thing if you, if you the identity matrix, uh, so this becomes 3, this becomes 3, now I have a scalar, I can divide the 3's, right? And then so ultimately then I can solve for sigma kk that it's equal to minus p over ks. So then the total strain, the total strain is the deviatoric part, the, to the total strain is, uh, well, the deviatoric strain is equal to that plus that, right? But the deviatoric strain is equal to zero, right? So the total strain is then just equal to that. And now we have, we know what that is in terms of these things, right? So then the total strain 
tensor is equal to minus P over 3 KS. So again, that just comes from this, this sort of thing, right? The deviatoric strain, which is zero, is that minus that, so that equals that. And then I have this guy to plug in there, and I get that. Okay, that was all related to the solid, okay? So then, if we consider now the skeleton, the total strain of the skeleton, which I'll write as sigma KL, is going to be equal to D K L I J times the effective stress K I J plus P I J minus the strain of the solid skeleton right and now this is a little bit right we have this constitutive model that says that so this is just a constitutive model, generalized Hooke's law that says that C I J K L is equal to epsilon K L. I've just inverted this equation, right? So I solved for sigma K L, and I renamed, right? So then it, it, the solution to that is I J uh, well K L I J inverse. Okay, and, I, and then I just renamed this guy D K L I J. All right, so D K I L J is C invert, essentially. So that's our generalized Hooke's law. I just inverted it, okay? But now we want to write down the total strain for the solid skeleton. The total strain for the solid skeleton includes the stress. And we put, and we use the effective stress minus this um, strain in the skeleton. All right, so that's the total strain. And then we're going to use now our corrected or BO effective stress, which is equal to sigma i j plus alpha p i j equal to c i j k l. This c i j k l, this is, these are the elastic constants of the solid skeleton. Okay, so remember, the solid plus the holes in it, the thing that you would actually measure in the laboratory, times the total strain. We have the total strain, d k l j that guy and you have to take my word for it but just like a matrix times its inverse you get an identity matrix right you get a matrix times its inverse you get the identity matrix if you have a fourth order tensor times its inverse, which that is what that is by definition, the result is a fourth order identity tensor. Okay. And so I'll skip some of the the details, but but then basically what what you end up with is That thing, the, you can subtract this from both both sides, so they cancel. Uh, you can multiply both sides by sigma ij, right? If you do that, 
that's a three, that's a three, that's a three, right? So then you could divide, you know, so that's like three alpha equals three minus. I, uh, I made a mistake. These all should be KLs. This should be KL. This should be KL. This should be KL. So this is KL. So that, that last one doesn't cancel. Uh, you get 3 over KS. Then you, then, then you can divide by 3. So finally, you get alpha equals 1 minus. C I J K L delta I J delta K L all over nine times K S. And if you show if you assume that it's isotropic material, so the C I J K L has twenty one components in general. If I assume it's isotropic, this becomes one minus K over K S. Right. And so again, this is Biot's coefficient. It's 1 minus K over Ks for an isotropic material, where this K is the bulk modulus of the, of the skeleton, right? It's the thing you'd measure in the lab of the solid skeleton, divided by the bulk modulus of the solid material only. And, uh, yeah. So it turns out, to go back to Terzaghi's definition, that for a sand, like he dealt in soils a lot. So for a sand, uh, this thing is almost zero. And so then you're just left with one, and you get back towards Augie's definition of effective stress. <laughs>